Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Thanks so much for tuning in. Welcome to another day in my slightly makeshift YouTube studio, aka my desk that is made from uh, scrap materials from the dump. <laughs> I have a feeling this might be becoming a regular occurrence that I, I will be uh, doing my YouTubes from here, so maybe I'll sort out the shelf behind me at some point. But in case you didn't know, this is actually some pretty priceless fossils, so that's quite exciting if you are a fossil nerd like my boyfriend, and kind of technically me by proxy as well. This YouTube's gonna be a little bit different from my usual ones because I did a an Instagram live last week, and a lot of you guys asked me to put it somewhere afterwards, and unfortunately with Instagram live, if you don't save it to your phone, there's no way Way that you can share it after it's gone after the 24 hours that it stays up. I didn't save my video but my coach did thankfully. So what it was was a video with uh, my coach and I believe wholeheartedly that social media should have some sort of value in it. So whether that's kind of comedic value or educational or whatever it is, it should have some value otherwise it's us just staring at pictures for no apparent reason and kind of feeling crap about ourselves. So I brought my coach onto my channel and asked him lots of questions that you guys had asked me um, so that I could give you guys a bit more of a kind of qualified answer to the questions that you frequently ask um, and it was all to do with running and uh, starting up running because of course in these times we're kind of limited for workout options and so I wanted to give you a kind of view of what it would be like to have a coach whilst not just kind of sharing my opinion on things which obviously most of the sh stuff that I share on here is kind of just my opinions or things that I've heard from my coach I'm sharing with you guys. My coach recorded himself uh, doing the Instagram live, thank god because I didn't, it means that I can share his answers with you guys. So I'm going to ask the questions because the audio in the uh, video that he sent, uh, he did of himself, is a little bit off. So you can't really hear the questions that I'm asking that well. So I'm gonna ask them here and then it's gonna switch over to his answers and I might add some of my own opinions onto that um, if you find that useful. If you don't, just skip on past it. And hopefully you guys can learn some interesting stuff. There are a lot of great areas in this whole subject but I hope you find it really interesting because I know that I did and I learned plenty in the Instagram live So yeah, without further ado, let's get going before we get started with the questions I will just let Chevy introduce himself. So this is who my coach is. My name is Chevy Ruff. I kind of these days I, I tag myself as a well-being and performance coach but I started my career off within the fitness world within running So running was a big vehicle for me to make change in my life. I left the city or kind of my old career behind about five years ago and it was running in a community that gave me the confidence to retrain as a personal trainer, strength and conditioning coach, running technique coach and then I set up kind of various running communities. I kind of was known as the, for lack of a better phrase, was like the running guy for a very very long time. It was my first love and my first passion. I've been ambassador for ASICS, for Lululemon, all relating to run and that's how I met Flora uh, a year ago as I, I, I supported her to the, the Tokyo Marathon. I'd still love running and I do a lot of work with runners still and, and operate within that space. But I suppose my specialism is helping runners focus on the 23 hours in the day, not just the hour in the day, if that makes sense and something we can, we can talk about and cover, but yeah. Question number one. So for someone who's looking to get started with running now, what should they be looking to do and how should they begin? Two different questions there. So let's, let's talk about how we, how we can approach training when either we are new to running or we're returning back to running when injured. And I think the, the first priority is really just about making sure that you can create the time in the week to train, right? We've got to remember that running is an energy demanding task and so is life, right? Like so is our jobs and, and looking after our kids or whatever it may be, the challenges we have, that also demands energy. And we don't have two separate energy tanks. We don't have an energy tank for training and an energy tank for life. It all comes from the same place. And guys, again, I don't talk about energy from a woo-woo hippie. I'm talking about the fact we run on energy, we run on calories. I think it's really important because people tend to kind of jump into running and they tend to kind of think, right, well, I need to train five times a week and I've got to do my strength and conditioning. I've got to do my mobility. And suddenly it can become this overwhelming task 
that we've got to complete. And we don't just have to create one or two habits. We feel like we've got to create 50 habits, right? We've got to eat right, we've got to stretch, get to bed on time, you know, and, and all these things. And remember, we can only really form one habit at a as a time as human beings. It's very hard for us to actually create multiple habits at once. And the percentages actually dramatically drop when we do try and do that. So what I try and say to people is really not necessarily jumping into a plan straight away. I actually think the first building block is jumping into creating time for yourself to train and look after yourself because that can be one of the hardest things is spinning the plates of life. It could just literally be like for week one um, and week two, you're literally just putting aside, you know, one to two hours a week to look after yourself. And that could just be walking for the first couple of weeks, just getting used to creating that habit and spending that time on two feet. You know, you're kind of almost A-B testing as well, right? Like, well, why didn't that day work? Or actually, I'm pretty crap at having the willpower to even go for a walk at six o'clock in the evening or seven o'clock in the evening. How the hell am I ever gonna go for a run if I'm struggling to talk myself out of going, you know what I mean, out going for a walk? So suddenly it could be like, okay, that doesn't work. So maybe let me just see if I'm a morning person or maybe I'm, I'm someone who has to train at the back end of the week because Mondays and Tuesdays are just too much going on and too much responsibility. So the first habit is just kind of A-B testing what time works for you with reference to training and looking after yourself. So the next most common question that I've been asked is how can I increase speed and endurance? This is a big uh, question, so it requires a big answer on to Chevy. There's a couple of ways of approaching this. How do I increase speed and how do I increase endurance? So I guess by endurance I mean distance, right? Like how far can I go? The way that you increase your ability to handle more load under stress, stress being speed and distance, is make the body stronger. How do we make the body stronger? Well, we train harder in a way, right? We, we have to force adaptions. So that's looking at like quality mileage, which is yes, in intervals and speed, but actually the way that we get stronger to go further or go quicker, and unfortunately most of you are not gonna like this answer, but I know it's something that Flora talks about a lot and I've seen the videos, to not run, but to actually do strength work. We've got to remember some of the, bre the biggest breakdowns that occur in the body after 10, 10, 10 kilometers is, is ligaments. Also running is about being able to hold a good shape and position for the intensity that you're operating at, whether that's speed or distance. And being able to hold yourself in a good position is about being strong. And it doesn't have to be not hugely strong. If you wanna get faster, if you wanna go further, and if you wanna do it with least likelihood of injury, then you kinda of gotta work on the core, you gotta work on your glutes, you've gotta work on your single leg strength, you've gotta work on your upper body strength. The more that you do that, I've had people run marathons and hit PBs on marathons only running once or twice a week, but they've been training in the gym to get the body stronger. So my advice is if you wanna go further and if you wanna go faster, you're gonna to have to get stronger and more mobile. And that's gonna be through basic body weight stuff, basic mobility work. I know you do some great videos. YouTube has phenomenal amount of resources now. So that's kind of my advice. And I know we're all looking for the running answer as well, right? Like how to how to build up actually within the running. So I, I'll, I'll be nice and I'll also talk about that because usually if it was me, I'd just be like, go and bloody do some squats. With reference to building pace and building distance. We all talk about the 10% rule, right? Like there's just this, the old mythical 10% out there is you should never increase your mileage by more than 10% every week. Now, I, I, I like that rule and I think there's a lot of coaches that will agree it's a good rule. You shouldn't go beyond 10% every week. And if you miss a couple of weeks, then you certainly shouldn't be trying to catch up where your plan tells you you should be. It's like, where was I? I was injured, right? I have to rebuild from there again, right? And also there's a reason you probably got injured or you were really tired and you missed that run in the first place. And that's the magic thing, is if you're missing runs and you're tired or you're injured, you have to really go back and question the plan that got you there in the first place. So it's the 10% rule is, is absolutely fantastic. You should really only build for about three weeks at a time, and then you definitely need a week of recovery. You don't just keep going and going and going and building and building and building. And I would say you've just got to learn to listen to your body. And I know, I'm, I'm not, unfortunately I can't coach everyone and can't be there for them, but if you're feeling niggles and you have done, and there's an injury there, should should you continue to add load the following week? No. I did a long run Q&A with my physio as well, who I also work with closely.
closely because I'm just super injury prone. And what she said is that, you know, when you start to feel a niggle, don't keep increasing the distances and just ignoring it. A, your plan should already allow for sufficient recovery. But B, go back to the previous distance that didn't cause you pain and build up from there. And if that's still causing you pain, go and visit a physio because they're the professionals who will be able to help you with your injuries and make sure that you get the right strength and conditioning work. Because we all have our weaknesses and that's why I've been doing so many of these videos. I think Instagram is filled with a lot of videos of sort of hit workouts and all this kind of stuff at home. And there's a lot of them out there. Um, and a lot of them are really great as well, don't get me wrong. But... That's not the only sort of stuff you should be doing. And when it comes to uh, running, a lot of the work I think that we need to be doing when we're sitting at our desk all day is kind of physio-esque mobility, strength and conditioning sort of work. It's a lot lower intensity, but equally equalizes uh, imbalances that everyone has. Absolutely. And it's um, and this is kind of, again, we can get into the mindset stuff another time and it will keep coming up in these conversations. I don't want to throw it, don't want to bombard too many people with too many thoughts about how to approach training. But I think that the key thing is to realize that if you are a runner, injury is going to come. The road is going to test you, right? It's it's just, it's a reality, like it's going to happen. You can even have a team around you and coaches, but if you're continuously trying to challenge your limits and that's something that you want to do or not, the fact of the matter is our bodies are stuck behind desks. We've got niggles, we've all got like faults, that, but we should love them. And the thing about running is you can either approach it wishing that you were never gonna get injured or you can approach it thinking, okay, I'm gonna get injured, but I have to realize that that's part part of the journey. And as long as I learn and I, I keep developing and I keep growing within my running, it becomes a great blueprint to, to you, ultimately. You can't avoid injury for a lot of runners. The rates are so high. So it's really about listening to what's going on with your body. And over time, you get more experienced. And with experience, then yes, you start to not put your body through so much. It starts to get stronger and adapt and grow. Something I talk about a lot in a lot of my videos, especially recently, has been breathing techniques. And this is something that Chevy has been talking to me about for a very long time um, he mentioned himself that he was trying to get me to focus on nasal breathing for my marathon in March 2019 and I didn't listen to him until this year I have been mentioning it more and more recently because I'm finally getting to grips with it um, but I'm gonna let Chevy explain a little bit about what sort of breathing techniques we should be using when we're running and why these are beneficial firstly well done you for finally listening to coach took you took your time Honestly, people, stubborn, joking. <laughs> so, stubborn. Let's just try and uh, simplify this as, as much as possible. So why do we want to breathe through the nose? Firstly, it's not that mouth breathing is bad, right? Like we have to make that really, really clear. But you kind of got to think of it like a gear system, right? And this is all relating to how we are spending energy as human beings. So generally, when we're breathing through our mouth, our body is working harder. It is more stressed. It is producing energy at a higher cost rate. We're kind of more what we call anaerobic than aerobic. We're burning sugars as opposed to fat. When we burn burn sugars internally, that generates more heat and that generates more <sighs> CO2, which is this waste product that we have to get rid of. Okay. So mouth breathing is fine. Like if I need a crap load of energy to do some intervals, right? Or like to run up a hill and get over the crest of a hill. Absolutely brilliant. I want that kick of energy. I want to be going to nose, mouth and mouth, mouth. If there's a lion that ran in here right now, I'd want to get the hell out of here, right? I'd want access to that first gear. But as I'm sure we can all appreciate, when you're in first gear in a car, you're gonna burn through your fuel, your energy really quick. It's also gonna come at a high cost to your engine to be able to stay in first gear, right? Like I can run a marathon, I can drive from here to Scotland in first gear, but it doesn't mean I'm gonna be really efficient with fuel or my car is gonna, gonna get to the other end in a good state or I'm not necessarily gonna enjoy the ride. Or I can drive in different gears. And that's the thing, we have these different gears. We can have nasal only, nose, mouth, 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 and they're all kind of playing with different energy systems, okay? But generally speaking, when we're breathing through our nose, that's less stress. We take less breaths per minute. We're more efficient with how we're delivering oxygen. So we all buy into VO2 max, that's great. Like VO2 max has a place. But actually, what we want to be able to understand is how we deliver that oxygen once we take it into our bodies, right? Just because we take a lot of oxygen in <gasps> doesn't mean we're efficient at delivering that oxygen to where it needs to go. The more we train through our nose, the more efficient we get at delivering that oxygen. Oxygen is a plentiful fuel source, right? Yeah. 
So our body is less stressed, it costs less energy. It's just a much more efficient way of running over a longer period of time. So here's the thing, we want to develop this tool. That takes time and it takes practice and it's hard, right? And this is the challenge that we have is runners are like, okay, I can kind of buy into what you're saying, Chef. I need to spend more of my time running nasal only than mouth, right? So if I'm running a 10K, I probably want to run seven or eight K nasal only, and then I want to move through the gears, right? If I'm running a marathon, I might want to run 22, 23 miles nasal only, and then start running up through the gears, okay? So I'm buying into that, Chev, but I've tried it, and it's really hard. Everyone thinks that to start out with, and yes. it, is. it really is. Because your body has been practicing breathing through here, right? Like we've really kind of mattered, we, we haven't adapted well to the lives that we live, and that has caused us to not be as efficient as we could be. It's again, we've got there, we're shallow breathing, we're hunched over in life, we've turned into these mouth breathers. So it's kind of really important to say like, yeah, your body's been practicing breathing one way for a long time, and now you're asking to breathe in another way, and it's hard, that's because your body's got to adapt. The same way that you were never able to run 26.2 miles straight off the bat, you had to learn a mile, two miles, three miles. Now here's the thing, and I know this is the thing that Flora hated, is to adapt what happens? You've got to run slower. And that's one of the biggest challenges is, for lack of a better phrase, we have to step over ego. And this is the big thing about runners is just because you can run a certain pace doesn't mean you belong there all the time, right? That's, that's one of the biggest things. So by learning to breathe through the nose, you have to drop the pace. But actually, what happens is people come up more connected to their running, to their movement, because they're working with their body and they're not constantly trying to push it into this first gear, which it's not comfortable being in all the time. And your pace has to drop off, but here's the wonderful thing. If you keep working at it over a, a week, two weeks, a month, two months, you start to adapt and your body starts to learn what you're trying to do. And then what happens is running just becomes a little bit more nicer. It becomes a little easier. Recovery becomes a little bit better because you're not constantly stressed. And here's the great thing. You actually get back to about 90 to 95% of the pace that you ran when you just ran mouth only. So this is the magic. If you've learned to run 90 to 95% of your pace now nasal only, you now have these extra gears that you can call on when you need them. So you start to open up all this untapped performance. And But generally, it just makes running nicer. I found that massively, but it took a really long time. And my boyfriend's been asking a lot about it as well, because he is my main running buddy. And uh, we've been doing a lot of hill running around here. And he's noticed that all of a sudden, I'm able to do hills, which I've never been able to do before. And they're not, you know, I mean, some of them are very steep hills, but a lot of it's just sort of slowly chugging up a hill for sort of 15, 20 minutes, and it just keeps going up. And one thing that I've been telling him that the way that I started to get into it, basically, was starting it, just walking around the place, just doing it when I was sitting down, doing it basically on much less intense uh, yes. activities. And then I was doing it spinning, which obviously is more intense, but still not quite as intense as running, for me at least. Um, and then eventually I managed to, on my slower runs or on my shorter runs or whatever it is, and then eventually I was able to do it on all of my runs. And it really has made a massive difference. So I really would recommend trying it out and just sticking with it. I think it probably took me two weeks to get used to doing it on my slowest run. And you've just nailed exactly what I should have said, which is how to start, which is, and it's the like, same thing for me, like people, people say, well, what shoes should I wear? And I'm like, I, I'm not really interested in the shoes that you wear when you run. I'm interested in the shoes that you're wearing when you're not running for the rest of the day, because that's where most of your adaptions are going to occur. And it's the same thing with breathing, but it's really important to, to think about Start, just start noticing how you're breathing through every day in life, right? Like, oh, how am I breathing when I'm running up the stairs in my house? I'm suddenly going to mouth breathing. Well, that's because your body's producing more energy to give you to get up the stairs. So now, oh, okay, wow, hold on a sec. I'm, I'm going more anaerobic. So now I'm gonna start going up the stairs with my mouth closed. Or I'm like you say, I'm just gonna start to see how I'm breathing when I'm walking, or just start to put it into your warm ups and your cool downs. Again, it's progressive load. People are like, oh, I can't do it, it's too hard. And I'm like, well, break it down into small, small sizable chunks and your body will learn and you'll get there. I had to look up science because I didn't trust Chevy. Um, and basically, <laughs> It slows down the breath coming into your system and because it comes in through your nose slower, it absorbs more oxygen that way. So there's more time for the oxygen to be absorbed, which means that, uh, and the CO2 to be released, which means that you can basically, yeah, 
it's more efficient essentially because it goes in slower which is why it's more difficult initially but it actually makes sense in the long run very quickly hemoglobin comes in i know you love some science don't worry people i'm not the science guy we won't go in too much hemoglobin right you've got your hemoglobin swimming around in your bloodstream you've got your, your oxygen cells attached to it right what you need is just because the oxygen comes into your system, it doesn't mean you deliver that oxygen well to where it needs to go. By breathing through your nose, you create um, a better a tolerance of CO2 carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide comes onto the hemoglobin and brushes the oxygen off to where it needs to go in the system. The bore effect. Wow, you're friends with that, people. Just throw the bore effect at them. <laughs> what shoes would you recommend for running in? This is a question I get asked all the time. Everyone is different, and I know that if I recommend a pair of shoes, then you can go out in them and they just do not work for your feet at all and that's because we all have slight different striding we have slight different shaped feet I'm gonna share some of my favorite shoes because I'm not a pro and I just know that some people just need somewhere to start so for me I like the Asics gel Nimbus 20s don't know if they make those anymore but they certainly make the 21s Asics gel Nimbus 21s I'm totally obsessed with the Hoka One One Clifton 6s but I had someone buy them uh, the other day uh, following on from a recommendation from me and they didn't get on with them so well and and then for my trail runs, I wear Columbia shoes, um, the Montrails or the Calderado 3, I think it is, and they are incredibly comfortable. You'll hear Chevy's advice now, and he is pretty reluctant to give any prescriptive advice on this for good reason. So first and foremost, and I always mean this very respectively because obviously so many people have asked this question, but it's kind of, it's, it's kind of a dead question to me. And I mean that very lovingly, and let me explain that because it's so individualized. It's like, I don't like to make recommendations on what people should be running in. And to be honest with you, these days amongst the top brands, it's, there's not like, they'll all throw technologies at you. They are overcomplicating the language. Most people are just absolutely scared of buying running trainers because it's not an enjoyable experience because it's like this technology, that technology, this technology, well, this, this foam and this, I'm gonna let you into a world's biggest secret. I'm no longer under contract with anyone and I can talk about this as openly as I want. It's all the same. It is all the same. The tech, don't get lost in the technologies. Don't get lost in overpriced promises based on some new found technology. Don't be sold to, which I am people by the way. So, you know, it's, it's okay. So I just have to make that really clear because it can be a hugely confusing world. So first of all, take the technology out of it and the, the, the words that we can all get lost and confused in. Secondly, um, absolutely, I would say go to an independent running store because they are an independent, right? Like runner's needs, the London Marathon has a shop in like, like there's, there's loads of them, right? No, I love running shoes. I love running shoes as well. I've got lots of them. Like, trust me, I'm just trying to be nice. I love running shoes. I'm on the running crack. Of course I have. But it's really important that you go, that go and get independent advice, right? And go and get somewhere that can test you. Now, here's the magic thing is quite simply, how do they feel? Simple as that. How do the shoes feel on your foot when you're trying them on? If they feel funny in the store, they're not gonna feel any better outside of the store. Yeah. And that's a really important, don't try and convince yourself because they're looking jet black and the other ones are an ugly color, right? Like don't try and just, cause you, they look great, which again, people, I like to make this look fly, but it's really important that you, it's how do they feel on your feet? If you can go run down the road, go run down the road and ask them to let you do that because running on road and running on treadmill is two different things. So it's really about trying a few different brands, a few different types and putting them on your feet and asking how do they feel and getting an opinion from an independent to do that. So that's a gait analysis. You can go and get a gait analysis. Absolutely. And if you're ordering online, order two or three pairs from different brands, different styles, get them on, try them around and walk around them in the house and don't leave the house and just start to see how they feel. Definitely, and I suppose a couple of little tips are, there's some YouTube videos on how to lace your shoes up properly as a runner, which is a very, very important thing to do. Look at those YouTube videos. But the second thing I would suggest is go and try shoes on when your feet are warm. So maybe go for a walk around them because your feet swell and grow a size, um, half a size or something like that. So it's really important that, because they can feel totally different 
once you've got them on and, and you're warm and your stuff like that. So do that. So that's that's my kind of answer. I know someone just put a question out there. Are there any energy saving shoes out there? What will save you energy is moving more efficiently as a runner. If you learn how to focus on your technique, your cadence, learn how to pick your feet up a little bit sharper. If you do some strength work and learn how to hold your body better, you'll create less impact on the ground and that will save you energy. So that's kind of my, my advice. Aside from shoes, people have been asking also about the kind of barefoot running community and this is something I'm very interested in as well. If you read the book Born to Run, there's a lot spoken in there about the kind of barefoot running community and the benefits that that could have. Yes, there are lots of purported benefits to running barefoot, but as Chevy will say, it's something to be a little bit careful about. As mentioned earlier on, I'm interested in what people are wearing on their feet for the other 23 hours in the day, right? It's really important to remember that feet ultimately should be like our hands. They should be as strong, they should be as dexterous, you know, they should, the toes should be able to spray like this. Ultimately, essentially feet are second hands. I'm sorry if feet, feet freak you out, like I, I, I fully apologize, but feet are second hands. But the problem is we put them in leather tombs and those leather tombs stop our feet from functioning how they should. We lose the arch, the toes scrunch together, we lose strength, they get weaker. By doing so, they don't absorb as much impact as they usually do. And that's where we start to see knee problems, lower back problems and so forth. One of the quickest ways of dealing with back problems and knee problems is helping people strengthen their feet because it takes a lot of pressure and load off of everything that comes upstream. So the way that we can do that is not running barefoot, <laughs> okay? It's looking at the shoes we wear throughout the day. So the shoes that I would recommend are things like Vivo Barefoots. They're expensive, but they last a long, 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 long time. They're really great, great brands. They give a shit about you and your feet. Like they are fantastic. And the environment. Yes, so they're really, really great guys. Wearing those throughout the day, on the week, Weekend, being as barefoot as possible, that will strengthen your feet, that will lend back to saving you energy and protecting your body upstream. There's a, a brand called Strike Movement. Strike Movement are a Canadian brand. I'm, they are pretty much, people like to know what I wear, they're what I wear 24 seven. They look fly and also at the same time, they are so designed to move with your feet and they're great from running, training in the gym or whatever it may be. So that's it and just spend time barefoot and if you can do, if you wanna start transitioning, get advice. It's a very slow process. Do strength exercises on your feet for six months, seven months, eight months and then just go to the parks, go to tracks and do your warm ups and your cool downs and that's it don't go into the run but i wouldn't i wouldn't recommend anything beyond that without professional advice on the energy saving thing about shoes two things one thing is that these are really marginal gains and as chevy was saying biggest gains that you can make are on your technique and on your training for the vast majority of us we're not professional athletes and we are not the bolt level or the mo Farah level or whatever it is we're not the level at which you sort of 3%, 4%, whatever they're called, the Nike ones, uh, Vaporfly, maybe that's a different one, um, are gonna actually start making a difference. Also, the vast majority of us aren't actually strong enough to be able to use the shoes properly if we've not got perfect technique. So um, I was listening to a great podcast, this is the second point, with um, uh, the running channel, YouTube channel I recommend, and it's Emma Kirkio, uh, I think is her name. She's a shoe and foot running specialist, um, and she has all of this information, so if you are interested and I would really go uh, recommend to go check her out and check out the podcast as well. So yeah, go and do that. Now, one of the biggest questions that I got asked um, when we first went into lockdown was, how am I supposed to continue training when my races have been delayed? And this is understandable. Like so many people who have been training for races are on a very prescriptive training plan. So it can be quite overwhelming to suddenly be just left in the lurch, not really knowing when to train or how to train because your race isn't when you originally thought it was gonna be. And I totally understand this. It's something that obviously happened to me as well. I had the London Landmarks half in March, supposedly, Brighton 10K in April, Jurassic Coast Marathon in May, and one of the Threshold Sports Ultra Marathon 84 kilometer events in July, and then a, an adventure race in June as well. So I had a lot of races that I was supposed to be training for. So I know how you feel. Chevy gives a good response to this, but just to go through what I think is basically, basically I think be kind to yourself 
run for the sake of running, run for the sake of enjoyment, uh, rather than having to strip, uh, stick to a strict plan. And also use this time as a way to work on your weaknesses. And we all have weaknesses. And I've been doing a lot of physio recently. Since my half marathon, my t band has been playing up a little bit. So actually it's a really good time to be taking a step back, keeping up the training, but taking a bit of a step back to work on any imbalances or weaknesses that you might have. And as we will see, Chevy kind of agrees with that. So yeah listen to what he has to say. First things first is let's remember why you started to run in the first place. The reason you started to run in, in the first place was to feel better about yourself. And you've, you've got this great tool that you have found that helps you manage the stress of life. And maybe something that's causing you stress in life is the fact that your race has been postponed. So if it's been postponed and you're stressed about it, go for a run. Maybe that'll clear your head. I think it's really important to reflect on, on first of all, the reason that you run, right? You are never the sum of one race and one run. You are the sum of a thousand, two thousand, and runs of a lifetime right and again it's about what kind of runner do you want to be long term and you know life will throw you hurdles I'm sure there's been other things in your life that have cancelled historically you know you, you you've been here before so I think it's really important to reflect on the fact that I love running I do this for a reason to keep my health the race will happen at some point there will be races out there and I thoroughly look forward to the day that it comes and and I'm going to focus on getting myself stronger and learning and growing and developing that before I get there. So remember, honest to God, people, like 60% of the people that I know that turn up for races are very, very underprepared. And that's not that they should have done more miles. It's never that they should have done more miles. It is never that they should have done, I, not never, but 99% of the time, more miles wasn't the problem. More recovery, more mobility, more strength work, more stretching, more technique work. These were the things that people didn't do enough of. So what you've got an opportunity here is to ultimately look after yourself a little bit more and to educate yourself so you can keep doing this thing you love. So I would spend that energy that you've got on just understanding, right, how can I put a bit of strength work into the end of my run? Like, how can I put a bit of mobility in at the end of my run or the beginning of my run? Like, how can I just play with the 60 minutes that I'm running with? Maybe I go for 40 minutes through the woods and I do 20 minutes of strength work. Maybe I can practice this nasal breathing because there's no pressure. I haven't got a run, I haven't got a hit time, so maybe I can practice that. Maybe I can, t I can try running at different times a day and maybe I can start keeping a diary about how well my energy feels or how good my energy feels on Thursday morning when I had a good night's sleep on a went. I don't know, right? That's the whole point. You can test and you can learn and use it as an experiment. If none of that's working for you, all I'm gonna say is you're gonna get bored running the same routes and the same distances and not have anything to aim for. So at the very least, mix up your running as best as you can. Go around different routes, run without headphones, or go for a run through the woods or whatever it may be. Play. Play is so important to managing our stress, our well-being, and it's such a fantastic tool. Go play. It also just makes you a stronger runner, I think. The, the times that I've made the most progress in my running is not when I'm training for a race. Yes, actually, I make the quickest progress, but in terms of my enjoyment of runs and actually getting into a routine and getting into a habit is when I really look forward to going out for runs. And I don't really do that in London so much. I do that down here in Dorset because it's just, it's harder, but it's so much more fun. For people who are just starting out running, what would you recommend for their kind of training split week on week when they're looking to start running, but maybe should be doing a bit of strength and conditioning as well? Very simply, um, it all depends on how much time you have in a week. Down on lockdown, no, no one's got anything else to do. You're absolutely right. But what I will say about it in, in the current climate is that we are we are still in a state of, of stress and crisis for a lot of us at the moment and actually trying to keep our head in order trying to keep our feelings and emotions in check costs energy keeping keeping our shit together costs energy everyone's saying that we we've got all this energy to spend i have been one of them who has been like said that at points and i'm like well hold on actually for some of us we're just trying to spend that energy keeping our shit together it might not be easy for us to suddenly go training and while our bodies are actually in actually in a protective mode right now our bodies are going like actually i'm not going to give you any resource right now from that perspective if you're just think about what energy you have what time you have and i think about easing yourself into it and i think that maybe just for the next couple of weeks i would say if you are really starting out and you've got a blank canvas don't just build a running program build a running strength and mobility program in one so look at how you can do 60 minutes of a little bit of mobility for 10 minutes a little bit of strength work for 10 minutes 
and a little bit of running for whatever's left over in the math that I can't remember. 50, 40, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. That's what I would focus on and try to do that twice a week, twice a week, because then you're not trying to kick your shit out of yourself. Like why can't, even in lockdown, I can't train seven times a week. You know what? I think that's what a lot of people are struggling with at the moment. They expect that because we've got not very much other stuff going on, that they should have all the energy in the world to be doing their training. And I have to say that actually that's not been the case for a lot of people. People are suffering and struggling for energy quite a lot because they're having to deal with a lot up here. As we say, right, and you know, I've had this conversation and self-control and willpower is a muscle that depletes throughout the day the more that you use it. 20% of our calories go to our nervous system and our brain. Chess masters burn up to 6,000 calories in a game, but they're just sitting there. Well, actually what they're having to do is navigate the chessboard in front of them. Life is like a chessboard right now, right? And they're having to use self-control to be able to keep their emotions, thoughts, and feelings in check. And this willpower, this muscle, we measure this in a laboratory. It depletes throughout the day. That's why we all kind of get to Sainsbury's after a hard day's work and we just can't make a decision on what to eat. So it's really important that we're trying to keep our shit together and wear a mask and be happy for the people that we love. We're trying to learn how the new ways of working and operating, that is consuming calories and you need those calories to run and create habits and routines to go and run and for the motivation and all that so it's super important that i'm like no shit your body doesn't want to run right now it's not that you're no not motivated it's just evolution's way of saying like hey there's kind of shit going on right now you know this lovely thing that you do for fun well actually we're kind of in a survival mode and i need you to adapt to the problem in front of you and then we can start to talk about that again so it's Really important, and so my final bit of advice on this is if you are really struggling, then go for a bloody walk. If you run to feel better about yourself, well, 145 minutes of walking in a week has similar mental health benefits as antidepressants for some people. Get back to walking. Nature is fantastic. It pushes back on our stress response. But maybe do the walks at the time of day when you think that's when you want to start running. So at least you're kind of building that habit. And then maybe go for the walks in your running gear. And then maybe in a few weeks time, you think I'm just gonna run this last stretch on the way home and that's it. I think it's kind of falling back in love with the reason that we did it in the first place. Absolutely. What is the best time of day to run for a runner? Best time of day for, to run is the time that you wanna go for a run. Yep, uh, I agree with that. I run at different times a day, depends when I'm fancy it, when I can kick my ass up. How should they be aiding their recovery? What's the best way to kind of speed up recovery and make sure that the body's getting fewer injuries? Recovery techniques is respect the stress cycle. Running is a stressor, it's a stimulus. And so is me engaging this conversation right now. I'm focused, I'm spending energy, my system's more fight, flight, freeze than rest and recovery. Work is a stress cycle, watching the news is a stress cycle, inbox is a stress cycle, having a conversation with family that's tough about money at the moment is a stress cycle. A day is a stress cycle, okay? And running within that is a stress cycle. There's nothing wrong with that because stress is ultimately energy, right? The reason that our heart rate changes, we feel anxious, we feel stressed, the reason that our respiratory rate changes is because our body's starting to convert energy, right? From a physiological point of view, stress is energy. It's our body giving us the energy to complete the task at hand. So we can talk about this again, guys, and I'm being very black and white just so we can get through this, but I appreciate there's gray areas. We have to understand that running is fantastic. Our body can give us the energy and focus to go out for a run. It can give us the resources it can put us into first gear but here's the thing we don't get stronger on the run right we get stronger when we've pushed back on the stress response and we started to close the stress cycle down and tip our internal physiology from fight flight or freeze to what we call parasympathetic rest and recovery that's where our body starts to heal that's where we start to process it's also where we have access to creative and strategic logical thinking but that's another thing right like we have to tip the dial the other way. What's the biggest thing that runners do is they ignore cool down. They just go for a run and straight into the next thing, right? They don't push back on the stress response. We can actually start to focus on recovery while we're running. So we can start to, if we start to nasal only breathe, then it's not gonna cost as much energy. It's not gonna be as painful. You've done a vlog on this, go and check it out. Link wherever, ding, 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 that would be great. See that, oh, I've got you Florida, all right. But it was a really great vlog. I think we had a really, really good thing. So. I think that it's, it's important to understand that how you breathe can limit the amount of stress that you put your body through. And if you can limit the amount of stress that you put your body through throughout the day, you don't have to have as much recovery. It's not as hard to bounce back from. That's why breathing is so great. The second thing is closing the stress cycle, putting in something to basically relief relieve yourself of the stress that you've been through, right? To close the stress cycle down. So simply put, if you've gone for a run, if you don't have time to sit down and do some stretching or whatever, 
just make sure the last five minutes of your run is a walk and start to match your breath with your walking because you're starting to push back on your stress response. You're starting to move from first gear into second, third, fourth, right? Let's say fifth is sleeping. So doing that and slowing down your breath. Yes, if you can sit somewhere and just take 10 breaths through your nose, inhale and then slow the exhale down. That is the most direct way that you can close the stress cycle down. So just slowing your breath nasal only. And then the best way that you can close the stress cycle of training in the day is getting a good night's sleep. So I know that not many people are lucky enough uh, to have a coach or don't feel the need to have a coach. But of course, in any other sport except for running, it seems that when you're learning the sport, you get some professional help because there's some sort of technique to learn. When we start running, we just assume that we know how to run already. Without having the space to move, how would you uh, recommend that people fix their form or focus on technique? What are the kind of pointers that you would give? Yeah, I was, I was just like, I was about to say, how can I get up and do this? Maybe the next one we do, I'll, I'll, I'll find a space and we can, I can do it. So, so think about the shapes that you create and how they lend themselves to the sport that you want to do. So what I mean by that is good shape, bad shape, right? Like bent over, hunched over, this shape isn't great for running because because ultimately we're broken in the middle, we're broken at the spine, we're basically, our butt is flying backwards, so we're kind of, we're sending our center of mass, our body weight the other way. We wanna go forward, we don't wanna go backwards. The thing about, think about the shape is, think about your ears, shoulders, and hips nicely aligned. Don't think about flaring, that's what a lot of people do. Just think about a nice ears, shoulders, and hips nicely aligned. Think about having slight engagement with your core, so the faster you go, the more it needs to be engaged, but if you're just running generally, nice party pace, think about a 10% switch on, 20% switch on, right? Keeping it nice and engaged. And then just think about those ears, shoulders, and hips nicely aligned. And just think about nice light feet as you're running. That's it. Ears, shoulders, and hips nicely aligned. And the best way that you can practice that shape when you're not running is going into a top plank position. So go into YouTube and, and, and Google top plank position. Hold that ears, shoulders, and hips nicely aligned in a plank position. And then your body starts to understand what you're trying to do, right? And then you can translate that strength work into your running. Your body will have a memory for that and it will translate across. Without demonstrating it, I think that's the easiest way that I can say, ears, shoulders and hips, nicely aligned, 10% engagement in your core, practice with a plank position. We can do another entire um, IG live um, on, on technique that yeah. find that useful. One thing also is people have been talking about cadence and actually focusing on cadence has been one of the biggest, and made one of the biggest differences to my running style and also how injury prone I am. I used to run with a cadence of about 160 and that basically means that you're taking fewer strides per minute and each stride that you take is longer. Um, and when you do a longer stride, you reach out with your leg in front of you and you hit the ground with your heel, with heel striking. And that is basically kind of the cause of yeah. my IT back syndrome along with a few other things. Yeah. Um, and Sherwin helped a lot with that alongside my physio. Yeah. Again, one of the quick changes that we can make that can have great impact is cadence. You know, for me, I tend to start with a couple of things very quickly, and that's breathing and cadence, because you send two to three times your body weight up your leg with every step that you take. There is a lot of impact that is going upstream, and the problem is that runners just spend too much time on the ground, so then that's just creating more impact, more stress, traveling everywhere, right up all through your body. So the less time you have on the ground, the, less, the more light that you can be, the more elastic you can be, the less wear and tear it is of your body. So absolutely, so the first thing I would think about is just, you know, if you're going for a run, if you don't want to have a metronome in there, we can do whole things on this. We can talk about this, it's great. We can get into the, the thing down the line, but just nice light feet. Just think one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And as soon as your foot hits the ground, just pick it up again. And it's just a nice way of starting out, kind of learning how to improve your cadence. If someone is looking to do a metronome, what sort of cadence should they have? There's a difference between muscle elasticity and muscle contraction. So most people um, basically just put too much energy into running. They're just constantly making it, like you, right? You're a power runner, you're a sprinter. And I was like, when I first saw you run, I was like, dude, you're just making this so much more harder than it needs to be. And that's because you're using muscle contraction. You're powering through each step. We're running really when we start utilizing muscle elasticity. So just nice and light feet and nice and light muscle movement. Where we start to utilize muscle elasticity is at a cadence of 180. So that's kind of 90 beats per like per foot per minute. So it's 180 beats per minute, 180 cadence. Now, don't try and go to 180 beats per minute, right? 
Like the thing is count, go out for a run and have a timer and count how many steps you take in a minute. And then you might count between both legs. You might count, I only take 160. So you trying to go from 160 to 180 is quite a significant jump straight away. And a lot of people will be probably 140s, 150s. So maybe you just think for the first couple of weeks, let me give myself time to adapt gradually, i.e. you don't run a marathon straight away. You break it down into each mile. So maybe go, okay, so this week I'm just gonna try and get from 160 to 165 or 66 or whatever, right? and then just build gradually. But 180 is where we start to utilize muscle elasticity. That should be your party pace, 180. Any final words of encouragement for anyone getting started out? Be kind to yourself, right? Like, and be okay with not being okay at the moment. Be okay with like, today I just don't want to go for a run. And then suddenly, just listen to your body, listen to your inside view. And we can talk, there's something we can talk about down the line about how you can actually be your own coach. But just listen to your body. If you don't want to go today, don't go. Go for a walk. I love that. I actually just did a blog post about that that came out at lunchtime today. So go and check that out. Okay, that's it. I hope you found that useful. As I said, like, I just thought it would be better just to give Chevy the uh, microphone and share what he has to say. I know this is my channel, but I like to give um, advice from actual professionals because I think it's probably a little bit more useful than advice just from me. Having said that, most of what I do say is directly from what they've told me, if that makes sense. But yeah, if you have any questions, hopefully we'll be able to do more Instagram lives in the future. So do comment them down below. Of course, there are some people who would disagree with some of the things that he said, but um, I would recommend going to check him out on Instagram and you can ask him those questions. His Instagram handle is at the wellbeing CEO um, and he works on all sorts of stuff to do with running and mindset and lifestyle and all that kind of stuff and it's honestly absolutely fascinating and as I mentioned and as he mentioned in the Instagram live running does not exist in a vacuum it exists within our lives and there's no point trying to pretend that we're machines and that we can do everything all the time without having any sort of repercussions mental health wise or physical wise or injury wise whatever it is so yeah just be kind to yourself remember that this is a stressful time but the running can be one of the best things that you can do for your mental health and getting out is very very good for you as long as you can do it safely so i hope you enjoyed that and um, do hit the subscribe button and the thumbs up if you did enjoy this and i will hopefully see you next week bye